amen, amen, amen. Amen. Come on, can we just give it up for Pastor Bob and Monica and what they are doing in this house? Come on, isn't it amazing what's happening? Y'all are a part of a house that is making an impact not only in this community, but in communities beyond that. And that is a reason to celebrate. Amen. Now, Pastor John, we rehearsed. I said, come on, now say it back to me now. I'm yucking it. <laughs> My name is Chi Chi on Yekine. Let's say it together on three. You ready? It's on Yekine. Here we go. One, two, three. On come on, somebody. Praise God. It is my real name. Uh, my parents are from Nigeria. I'm firstborn generation in America. I am a Texan through and through, the greatest country on earth. <laughs> Come on, Texas pride is a whole new different of pride. I'll tell you that. Is it a Texan? Yeah, but any more Texans? Come on, we're pulling together today. We're pulling together today. I got your back. Just know that. Man, y'all have just kind of wrapped up a series undaunting faith, undaunting faith. And you've spent several weeks talking about faith, dissecting faith, uh, looking at heroes in the faith as seen in Hebrews 11. So many amazing faith stories and journeys and sermons that Pastor Bob and Pastor Austin have been delivering over the past few weeks. And I've had the pleasure of watching a lot of those sermons in, in preparation for being here with you guys today. Wanted to watch those. Got to watch a ton of those messages. I don't know if Pastor Austin's in the building, but well, well done. Well done. Um, the way you've been able. Yeah, give it up for Pastor Austin. The way you've been able to communicate the word of God has been nothing short of amazing. And so, man, I'm from Texas, and I feel lied to. Let me explain. I was told that, man, when you go to the Northeast, it's going to be cool and breezy. <laughs> it's going to feel amazing. Man, you're going to be able to walk out. I couldn't wait to do sizzling on Wednesday. I couldn't wait. And apparently, I brought all of Texas's humidity with me. And so I don't know where all that cool breezy weather went that I was promised but I'm gonna need it to make an appearance before I leave or I will feel cheated, but it's all right, we'll do it. So if you see me with this rag up here just struggling for my life, <laughs> just mind your business, just mind your business, just mind your, just mind your business. Hey Amen, are y'all ready to get into the word this morning? Come on, this is the word of God. Are y'all ready to get into the word this morning? Amen and amen, amen and amen. Like I mentioned before, you just wrapped up a series on faith. And for all my vacation Bible schoolers, Sunday schoolers, come on, somebody say it with me. Now faith is. Come on, don't stop. Y'all were right there. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things of things not seen. Come on, y'all have been talking about it for weeks, and the very idea of faith being the evidence of things not seen means that it's from a place that we can't experience with our five senses. It's from a place we can't experience with our five senses. And so I titled this sermon this morning, It Starts in the Heavenlies. It Starts in the Heavenlies. Now, Pastor Bob made mention that as the conclusion of the, the faith series goes, y'all will be starting a series on Proverbs. And I was like, you know what, Chi Chi, you talk about whatever you want. Throw a proverb in there too, though. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and so to set the foundation of what we're talking about, we're going to read Proverbs 18.21 real quick. We're going to read Proverbs 18.21, and it says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. When I read this, I'm amazed because when I look out 
all the mountainous things in Texas is just plain. So I always love coming to the Northeast. You see mountains, hills, trees. You look at all these things. You look up at the stars. You're in awe of God's creation, everything he's done, everything he's been able to do. And you say, wow, isn't God amazing? Isn't he awesome? Come on, where are my nature lovers at? Praise God. That's my wife back home. That's not me. I'm glad she connects with God and nature, but not I. Remember in those early dating stages, she's like, let's take a walk, babe. I'm like, yeah. She's looking around like, do you feel it? I was like, you mean the heat, bugs, and humidity? Yes, I do. <laughs> and we'll just be in awe of God's creation. But I love this verse so much because when you think about it, in Genesis, when you see the creation story and God's creating the heavens and the earth and the animals of the land and the sea, everything that we see, touch, and experience with our five senses, he created with his mouth. He created with his words. Let there be and there was. But when it came to me and you, he stopped and said, wait a minute. I want to make them with my hands. The only thing he said, I want to make them with my hands. And that same breath that he used to speak all of those things into existence, he breathed into us and we came alive. How awesome is it to know that the power of life and death is in our tongue? The power of life and death is in our tongue. Real quick story and then we'll move on. See, this is the second service, so I'm not looking at the clock every two minutes. I can take my time a little bit. Man, there's this story I saw that Ikea did, and it was an anti-bullying campaign. You should look it up. An anti-bullying campaign, and they didn't know that they were proving the principles of God. And so they had two plants, both the exact same plant, the same measurement, same height, and they set them up about 10 feet apart in a children's rec center in direct sunlight. And there was a sign above one that said, Speak love to this plant. Tell it it's beautiful. Tell it it's amazing. Tell it it's great. And there was a sign above the other that said, bully this plant. Call it ugly. Call it stupid. Call it dumb. Call it all of these things. And for 30 days, the plant that they spoke life over grew a few inches. And the plant they spoke death over wilted. There's power of life and death in the tongue. Amen? So, with that, it starts in the heavenlies. It starts in the heavenlies. Faith starts in the heavenlies. We look through Scripture and we see Old Testament and New, this idea that we are heavenly beings, that God knew us before the foundation of the earth. And so, when I say it starts in the heavenlies, specifically today we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare, prayer, and fasting. Spiritual warfare, prayer, and fasting. It starts in heavenly places. Paul establishes this order for us in Ephesians, and we're going to look through. We got a ton of scripture today because we love the word of God in this house. So we're going to be going through a lot. I need y'all to listen fast. Can we do that? Listen fast. Come on. Who are my podcasters in here that listen to podcasts Listen to YouTube videos, got long commutes. Now, is there anybody that listens to it in like 1.5 speed? You know, for my overachievers, two, and two times speed? That's like, I don't need to hear the vocal inflections and the vocal emphasis. Just give me the information. My brain will lock it in and process it, amen? Come on, I won't do two times like I did the first service, but we gonna, we'll do one and a half. Or actually, I got time. We ain't got nothing after this. We'll do 1.25. Meet in the middle. Meet in the middle. So I heard it said, and I loved it, it says everything visible and physical is preceded by that which is invisible and spiritual. Everything visible and physical is preceded by that which is invisible and spiritual. So unless you get an understanding or a revelation of that, you may be fighting the wrong foe, the wrong way, at the wrong time. You may be fighting the wrong foe, the wrong way, at the wrong time. And so Paul, we're going to go into Ephesians, and so Paul is explaining this place. He uses this term 
a lot throughout Ephesians. This term, and it's called heavenly places. Heavenly places. It's a place. It's a realm that, that we cannot see with our natural eyes. It's where the, 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 the heavens are, if you would. And he establishes this right off the bat in Ephesians. In Ephesians 1, verse 3, it says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So right here off the bat, Paul's saying every spiritual blessing, not some spiritual blessing, but every spiritual blessing is found in the heavenly places. Every one. Come on, the fruit of the Spirit, what you receive from the Spirit of God that was given to us because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus when he left, and he left his Spirit here, those spiritual gifts, those things are found in the heavenly places. Come on, Bible scholars, fruits of the Spirit, ready, go. Come on. Some of y'all are saying hello because you're nervous. You're getting it wrong. I love, joy, peace. <laughs> Come on, every spiritual blessing found in the heavenlies. Paul is establishing an order of operation, if you would. And then if you jump down to verse 19 through 23 in Ephesians 1, it says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. He's establishing this order. Every spiritual blessing comes from the heavenly places. Jesus, having been raised to life, is now seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly place. If we go to Ephesians 2, in verse 5, he says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the where? Come on, in the where? seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Every spiritual blessing found in the heavenly place. Jesus raised to life, seated in the heavenly place. Us now raised to life with him, also seated at the right hand of the Father with Jesus in the heavenly place. Paul continues in Ephesians 3, verse 9, it says, And to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That through the church, through me, through you, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the where? Heavenly places, not here on earth. Through the church, this wisdom is going to be made known to the rulers and authority in the heavenly places. And now my favorite, Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 17. Y'all keeping up scripture-wise? Y'all good? Come on, real quick, who has a physical Bible? Mm, nothing like some paper. I don't see very much in this section. Shout out to the young people. Digital. Come on, ain't nothing like the smell of leather when you open your Bible. Praise God. Praise God. Let's bring them back as I scroll through my computer Bible. <laughs> Praise God. Ephesians 6, verse 10, it says, finally, meaning after all that, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The schemes of the devil. Now, I, I didn't give the best definition of this in the first service, so y'all get the good stuff. Because I went and looked, and 
the definition of scheme, the dictionary definition, is a long systematic plan. A long systematic plan. A systematic plan. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the long systematic plan of the devil. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the where? Heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. Multiple times we see Paul say, take on the full armor of God. Now you have to think Paul's in a Roman prison while he's writing this. Come on, shout out to Paul for persevering in prison, getting stoned, getting shipwrecked, getting left for dead, bitten by snakes, all of these things, and he's pressing forward. And we're benefiting from it as a church today. He's sitting in a Roman prison. Likely there's a Roman soldier probably outside of his cell. And I imagine the Holy Spirit downloading things in him about this Roman soldier as he's looking, as he's writing, locked up, chained likely. And he's seeing the outfit, the full body, body of armor. And the Holy Spirit's probably like, you see that belt of truth? It's holding everything up. You see that breastplate? I want my church to put on a breastplate of righteousness. You see his helmet? Helmet of salvation. You see that sword? The only offensive weapon you need is the word of God. And he's writing these things down and we're reading them. But I want to go, I want to reread this foundational scripture that we have, if you would, Ephesians 6, 12. Ephesians 6, 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, I want to pause and point something out. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against. So Paul is saying, though we're not wrestling with natural things, we're not wrestling with anything that we can see or experience with our five senses. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But you are, in fact, wrestling. You're wrestling, but against these principalities and cosmic powers of darkness and evil and spiritual things that are in the heavenly places. You are, in fact, wrestling. Come on, where are my dads at in here? Come on, Dad. Come on. Wait, hands high, proud. Come on, Dads. Yeah, Dads. Come on, me and my wife, we're, we're, we're in a, a, a fertility journey ourselves right now, and I just cannot wait to be a dad. I can't wait. But one of the reasons why I can't wait is I remember being young, and I used to wrestle my dad. And it didn't matter how hard I tried, how much force I exerted, my dad gave me the business. <laughs> and I'm sure my dad, as many of you, come on, who wrestles their kids? Come on, waving them proud like, yeah. <laughs> I wrestle my kids. Now, when you're wrestling your kids, you know, sometimes you may have a moment where you let them pin you for three seconds. You act like you're letting them slam you on the bed or the couch. You know, you act like you're letting them punch you or kick you and it's like, oh, man, this is crazy. But you know, if you needed to, there is no level of force that your kid could exert that will keep you from giving them the business. You know. And so I can't wait to be a dad because I'm like, yo, it's going to be WWF in my house. It is happening. I mean, the good era, the 90s, the 2000s, I'm, it is happening. It is going down. Future kid, you may never hear this message. Just know, 
soon as you can walk, it's about that time. In Jesus' name. Now we wrestle. And so imagine if you were to lay idle and moved, not didn't move at all, didn't move at all, for days, weeks, every time you and your kid wrestled, you just laid there, just sat there, and your seven, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old just wrestled you as you laid idle, just got all the shots out that they could. Eventually, they would inflict some kind of damage. May not be the first time, may not be the second or third time, but eventually, if you laid idle and did nothing, they would inflict damage if they were wrestling you. Now, I believe in the same way, spiritually speaking, Paul says we're wrestling. He says we're wrestling. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against. If we were to lay idle, spiritually speaking, although just like the order that Paul established, every spiritual blessing, heavenly places, Jesus, heavenly places, us seated with Jesus, heavenly places. We don't war against flesh and blood, but against the things in the heavenly places. Through the church, we're supposed to give the manifold wisdom of God in the authorities and powers in the heavenly places. But if we were to lay idle, even though Paul is clear about the authority that we have over these things in the heavenly places, eventually it would inflict damage to us in some form or fashion that would then be manifested in our natural lives. Multiple times, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. How many times do you leave your house a week undressed, spiritually speaking? Are you even mindful of that? Is there something happening right now in your marriage, in your kids, in your finances, in your body, in your mental health? Is there something taking place that you're trying to find answers for, that you're tired of dealing with, that you're tired of struggling through, that you're tired of praying about, that doesn't seem to change, that could be a result of something taking place in the heavenly places? that we haven't decided to fight back against, that we haven't decided to take the authority that we've been granted. Could there be something that's happening? We have to put on our armor every day, every time, every day, every piece. Now, one thing that I love about the Northeast here is that on Thanksgiving Day, there's a parade. And Y'all really love this parade, Macy's Day Parade. Now, my wife moved from Pennsylvania to Texas. Our first Thanksgiving, she's like, 6 a.m., we got to put the parade on. Like, what? She's excited about this parade, seeing dozen of artists lip sync and all the things. <laughs> we all know they're not singing, but we celebrate, <laughs> we join, and we dance. And sometimes in the parade, they'll have, you know, a branch of the military or something will have a section and they're walking through, marching, often with like a rifle on their shoulder. I don't know why, I just feel like you got to go like that. But often with the rifle on their shoulder, maybe a sword at their belt, dressed, fitted. But you see, in a parade, they show the weapons. In war, they use the weapons. I feel like the church is in a position where often all we're doing is showing our weapons. We're parading around and we're showing our weapons all the while we're losing the real battle spiritually. We're losing it. Coming to church Sunday morning looks real great. But then we wake up Monday and I still haven't went to bed happy with my marriage. We wake up Tuesday, and my kid is still falling from God. We wake up Wednesday, and my mental health is still being attacked, and I don't know why. There's a battle that's taking place, and we have to put on the full armor of God, and, and God doesn't put it on for us. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, I heard it once said that you know you're not a kid anymore when you fall asleep on the couch and wake up on the couch. 
when mom and dad doesn't carry you to bed anymore. It's a sad moment. <laughs> New life stage unlocked. And so we have to be able to put this armor on every single day because we don't know or may not be aware of the spiritual warfare that is taking place. Again, Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that the schemes, the long systematic plans, the enemy has had a plan for your life for a long time. It's long and it's systematic. Scripture says he comes like a thief in the night, not parading through the front door. And so I want to talk about somebody in Scripture just to kind of paint this picture a little better. I want to look at Daniel chapter 10. Just for context, in Daniel 8 and 9, Daniel's visited by the angel Gabriel. He's having these visions concerning his people, concerning what's to come, concerning war, concerning all the things. And my guy is stressed out. He's stressed out. He's trying to figure out what happens, what's going to happen, how do I interpret this, what do I do next, what am I supposed to be doing? I feel like a lot of people in this room may be in a position where they're like, man, I am somewhere spiritually, mentally, maritally, family-wise, what am I supposed to do, what is happening, what am I doing? And so in Daniel chapter 10, in verse 2, it says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. For three weeks, he's mourning. Another translation says he didn't put any lotion on. So I was like, he was hungry and ashy. <laughs> Daniel was struggling, y'all. He was struggling. For three weeks, he's mourning. He's saying, what am I doing? He's praying. Didn't happen. He's praying for week two. Nothing. He's praying for week three, pressing in, morning. Nothing. And then you jump down to verse 12, and finally somebody answers Daniel. An angelic being shows up and gives Daniel the answer that he's finally looking for. And it says in verse 12, it says, Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. For the first day, you set yourself to understand and humbled yourself. Your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Joel Mutamali, says it like this. He says that the consequence of humility is to be heard by God. The consequence of humility is to be heard by God. Let's keep reading. Verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. Wait a minute. There is so much happening in this scripture. So Daniel needs an answer from God. He's mourning. He's hungry. He's praying. He's fasting. He's ashy. All of the things. He needs an answer from God. And then when his answer comes, it says, from the very first day that you humbled yourself and prayed, God answered you. Day one. And then he says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. Time out. So this angel showing up to Daniel, likely battered and bruised. Now, I'm a really visual guy. I love superhero movies. And so when I'm reading scripture, I'm always thinking of it like a superhero movie. That's my thing. And so I'm looking at this, and I'm like, wait a minute. What does that even look like? An angel of the Lord was sent day one, en route to Daniel, 
he gets jumped by demonic forces. And not only do they attack him, they hold him captive. Now, you're talking about spiritual warfare. That's a new level. Angels fighting. I don't even want to know what that looks like. I'm sure it's better than any superhero movie I've seen. But he's going to respond to Daniel, and he gets captured, held captive for 21 days. There were evil forces in heavenly places that held an angel up for three weeks. And so I'm looking at Daniel, and he's fasting for three weeks. He's fasting for more than three weeks, and I'm like, man. There's a ton of churches all over the world that do these fasts at the beginning of the year, which is amazing. A lot of them do 21-day fasts. Let's ask God what we're going to receive this year. Let's ask God the direction for where we're going to be going this year. Let's ask God what should we be putting our attention and focus on this year. And they do it for three weeks. But here, where this came from, where the the, the three-week Daniel fast essentially originated from, why did Daniel do this for three weeks? Because that's how long it took to hear from God. Now, how many of us press in or pray about something, and when it doesn't happen, we throw in the towel really quick, and the Holy Spirit's like, press in for three more days. We're like, man, I guess it's just not God's timing. Daniel continued to press in because he wasn't aware of the spiritual Warfare that was happening on his behalf. All he knew he needed to do was press in and pray more and continue fasting and not to give in, not to stop too early. He fasted until God responded. Now, I think this is absolutely crazy that that Michael, one of the chief princes, Daniel says, describes him as, Michael has to go rescue this angel. Now, this is where the superhero part comes. There is nothing in my being that can convince me that Michael did not do a superhero landing when he showed up. (laughs) He had to have done a superhero landing when he showed up. It's it's only right. You got your, your angel friend captured by some evil forces, and you gotta go save him? Man, Michael was in there busting everybody up. He had to have been. Landed fist down, knee down, the whole nine. But you think about it. Can you imagine what the scene was in heaven when Michael had to go rescue him? Just picture God on the throne. Angels singing holy, holy, holy. Circling the throne of God. Holy, (laughs) holy. Again and again. And then all of a sudden, if there's ever a moment where you're in service and Pastor Shim or Pastor John, you know, or Matt walks up to Pastor Bob during worship and whispers something, it's probably not good. It's probably not good. It's like, man, I've been leading worship in spaces where you see somebody go up and lean and tell the pastor something, and all of a sudden the pastor's expression changes. I'm like, ooh, man, it's Who didn't put that fire out? Now just picture God on the throne, angels singing holy. And all of a sudden, Michael walks up to God and is like, hey, God, uh, you know that um, angel you sent to go uh, help Daniel? Listen, I know you sent it about three weeks ago, but um, Daniel's still fasting and praying. So... And I can see God being like, go get him. Go, like, we got to send in the big guns. Michael, go get him. Superhero landing. Everybody's gone. Angel's free. And the angel goes to Daniel and was like, I got withstood for 21 days. But on the first day, I answered you. Daniel had a physical dilemma with a spiritual delay. And he's waiting. There's spiritual warfare taking place in the heavenlies. He wasn't aware of it. He just knew, God, you called me to pray and you called me to fast. So I'm going to be in this position. I'm going to be in this posture. And I'm not going to move until you move. He was answered on the first day. But it didn't make it to him until three weeks later. 
said, I'm not going to move until you move. Now, for starters, how many of us fast more than once a year in general? And now I'm talking to myself. I, I was just as convicted by this um, the first time I kind of read and, and was studying on this. I was just as convicted. I was like, God, I only fast once a year. And it's not even for me. It's for the church. We're doing it corporately, which is great. I'm like, God, you're going to move in this church this year. We got new building projects coming, new initiatives that are being started. God's going to have all the glory. Let's fast as a body. All those things are great. It's amazing. And then I remember one time praying about something in the Holy Spirit. I feel like he spoke to me so clear and was like, hey, Chi, you know what? If you haven't fasted about it, you don't care about it that much. If you haven't fasted about it, you may not care about it that much. Because if my word talks about fasting, if my word talks about prayer, and I'm giving you stories and example of what is the consequence of humility and praying and fasting, and you know that this works, and you're coming to me with these petitions, but you haven't even consecrated yourself in a posture that cuts off your flesh and opens up the things of the Spirit so that God can intervene. Could you possibly have things and answered prayers trapped somewhere in the heavenlies, in the heavenly places that we haven't pressed in long enough to receive from God? And now that we have the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus did, which Scripture says reveals the mysteries concerning the will of God, have I positioned myself in a way in proximity with the Holy Spirit through prayer and through fasting so that I can receive the thing that Paul says belongs to me? Every spiritual blessing. It comes in prayer. It comes in fasting. Sam Gibson from Pray New York spoke a few weeks ago at Sizzling Summer. I watched that message, and he talked about prayer. He talked about revival. And revival simply means that something dead being alive once again. And so there's so many things. He spoke about having revival in the church before we have revival in the world and transformation in culture. I would take that even a step further and say having revival in your own home before you pray for revival anywhere else. We're in such, a, such a, a divisive time in our nation right now. Palms are sweating as, as we approach November and people are nervous and people are worried and people are passionate about something. But if the only time you're passionate is about things outside of your home, if the only time you're praying for revival is in the nation but you're not praying for revival with the same level of passion for your marriage... For your children? We're so pressed about what's happening in the nation, and, and we should be. We should be praying for our leaders. We should be praying about what's happening in our nation. We should be praying for our children. We should be praying for education systems. But are we praying more for that than the immediate thing that God's actually called us to? Have you ever fasted for your marriage? We're going through the motions. Passion's gone. The kids are so busy. We just, it's all about the kids. We're just so focused on the kids. I mean, we're not upset, but we may not be happy. What would pressing in and fasting on behalf of your marriage and your kids do in your home? What would fasting do for your marriage? What would prayer and putting yourself in a posture of humility do for your marriage? I don't want to be in a position where I'm more passionate and the only time my wife sees my passion is for the nation, but I can't have that same level of passion and zeal for what's happening in my own home. I remember praying years ago, like, God, I want to see revival in this nation. What does it look like? And I felt the Holy Spirit was like, well, you need to draw a circle around your home and don't leave until revival happens there. How can you experience revival anywhere else if it hasn't caught you first? Are you on fire? Is your wife on fire? Is your, are your kids on fire? Is there things in heavenly places that are trying to make their way to us, but we haven't pressed in enough to be able to receive every spiritual blessing? 
every spiritual blessing. I want to go and I want to read Ephesians 6, 18. Joe, you could join me. I love this scripture. I love that Paul ends this, ends it with this. See, Paul knew that the enemy doesn't take days off. Scripture says that the only goal of the enemy, the only, only, is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's it. The only thing. Steal, kill, and destroy. He's not taking days off. How can we afford to? Scripture says that his mercy is new every morning. His mercy is new every morning. That means that there's an area in my life that I need mercy from the previous day. I try to get in the habit and say, God, did I count my mercy from yesterday? Did I count my mercy from yesterday? God, I need you. God, if you want me to pray, if you want me to fast, tell me about what. Tell me when. God, I'm going to press in for however long it takes. Ephesians 6, verse 18, it says, pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. See, prayer is earthly permission. Praise God. Prayer is earthly permission for heavenly intervention. It's earthly permission for heavenly intervention. Could there be something that you've lifted up to the Lord in prayer, in humility, and he answered you on day one? But somewhere, the thing that Paul says we're wrestling with caught up that answer. And the Holy Spirit's been trying to get your attention and say, pray fast, press in, pray fast. Press in. Pray at all times in the Spirit. What's in the Spirit? Pray at all times in the Spirit. Being mindful of the heavenly place in which we are supposed to operate. We are supposed to be praying heaven down, not earth up. We've been seated before the foundation of the world. God set it up so that we would be mindful that we have been seated in heavenly places with Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And we are to take authority over everything that comes against us in the heavenly places. Through prayer and through fasting. See, I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to call some of you even today. There's something you've been believing for, maybe for weeks, maybe for months, maybe for years. He's saying through prayer, through fasting, praying at all times in the Spirit. This last story, um, it was in December of 20, uh, 2022, December of 22. I'm talking to my wife and I'm like, man, I'm a worship leader by the grace of God. Get to travel all around the world, lead and worship in so many different bodies. God's blessed me and my wife. It's been awesome. But in December 22, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with worship, what I wanted to do with ministry what I wanted to do with media, vocationally, whatever the case was. And so I was praying in December, and <laughs> I felt the Holy Spirit say, well, have you fasted about it? And I was like, God, you know I'm too busy for that. Fast. Like, no, no food? Come on, let me get some appetizers. Jesus? Nothing? Have you fasted about it? I was like, no, nah, God, I ain't fasted about it yet. He said, oh, you don't care about it that much. I was like, oh, man, really? So I talked to my wife. I said, all right, sweetheart, after Christmas, <laughs> after Christmas, I'm going to press in for Jesus. And I want to hear from my marriage. I want to hear from myself. I want to hear for the call that God's placed on my life. If I have anything trapped in the heavenly places, I want to receive it. It's like, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm going in. January 1st rolls around. Got my Bible propped up. Boy, that first day of fasting, you on cloud nine. You ready? 
I was ready. I didn't predetermine how long I was going to fast. I said, you know what? However long you say, Jesus, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'll do. <laughs> Y'all, I kid you not. I'm praying. I'm on my knees January 1st, 2023. And I said, Holy Spirit, I'll do this for as long as you want. God, I'm committed. I'm going to press in. I'm going to press in. I'm going to press in. And I felt in my heart, the Holy Spirit go, great, we're doing this for 40 days. I said, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Come on, Holy Spirit, I rebuke any attack of the enemy during this quiet time. And I heard the Lord say again, we're doing this for 40 days. I was like, 40 days? I can't remember the last thing I did for 40 days consecutively. And the Holy Spirit said, do you care about your marriage or not? Do you care about what I want to do through your life or not? Do you care about what I'm doing in your local church or not? Do you care about what I'm doing in the lives of the youth that I've entrusted you with or not? So reluctantly, begrudgingly, I said, okay, 40 days. 40 days it is. So I fasted for 40 days. I said, God, and I was on the road a lot that time. Was busy. For the first 40 days, I was out of state, maybe 30 of those days. Doing ministry, worshiping. Doing all the things. And I was like, Holy Spirit, I'm going to need you for these 40 days. Going to all these places. They're offering all these amazing meals. And scripture talks about fasting. It says, don't let people know you're fasting. Don't look weak. Don't look tired. Wash your face. Appear to be normal. Appear to be full. Appear to be full of joy. It's like, hey, can I get you this all you can eat? I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Don't even worry about it. I'm okay. And I'm pressing in. And guys, I kid you not, on the 40th day, I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I just did a worship event, did a worship night where worship lasted for hours on a college campus. Lives were healed. People were, were touched. They encountered God. I'm in Tennessee, and I'm packing up on Friday morning, and I'm with my wife, and I'm sitting here in this space, and I'm like, babe, it's the 40th day. Hey, you know what? I didn't feel extreme clarity, but maybe, maybe, maybe God just wanted the nearness with me. And if that's all he wanted, then you know what? That's enough. If he didn't give me clarity on, on what I'm supposed to do in worship or, or in music, or, or that's enough for me. The nearness is enough. And I kid you not, the 40th day, I get a phone call. I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee, packing up, about to head to the airport in like an hour to go to the next city. I get a phone call. And it's from... Uh, the president of this music group called Jesus Culture. Some of y'all may be familiar. They've been around 25 years now. And he calls me and he's like, hey man, the past couple months, man, we've just been kind of praying. And I've done stuff with Jesus Culture before, had led at their conferences, youth conferences, led at their church in Sacramento. He called and said, hey man, we've been really praying and man, we, we've been kind of dormant for about nine years. We hadn't released any new albums, any new music, just been praying about what God wants to do next. But we feel the Lord say he wants us to start recording albums again, start doing music again. And man, I talked to the founder and we just feel like we just want you to be able to partner with us and come alongside us and do this project with us. Come be a part of what we're doing. Come be a part of what God's doing. He had no idea I'd been fasting. Crazy part, two weeks before that, my wife asked me, you feel like you heard from God yet? I'm like, no. It's like, man, what about with all the worship stuff? Like, what do you think is next? What are you going to? It's like, I don't know. And I'd written, I did songwriting things with a ton of different worship groups that a lot of us will probably know, people we probably know. 
And I felt the Lord during a couple weeks before that 40th day, he was like, if you could do something, what would you want to do? If you could partner with someone, who would you partner with? And I just remember the anointing that was on that house in Jesus culture when I was there. And I was like, you know what, God? I'd probably do something with Jesus culture. When I got saved, they transformed my life. I listened to How He Loves No Short than a thousand times. I know Kim Walker's whole part on that day. Amen. If you know, you know. And on the 40th day, I get that call. And I'm sitting here in Chattanooga, and I just begin to weep. I'm like, God, what? I said, well, God, why did you tell me 40 days? And I felt like he said, because that's how long it was going to take. And if you have given up or thrown in the towel any earlier, then the Holy Spirit wouldn't have been able to reach and encounter them. And I wouldn't have been able to tell them about you and you wouldn't have been in this position. And me and my wife just celebrated right there. And I repented. And I said, God, I'm sorry for ever thinking for a second that this doesn't work. I do care about my marriage that much. I do care about what you're doing in my life that much. I do care about what you're doing in the lives of the next generation that much. I do care about what you're doing in my local church that much. Thank you. Thank you. So in this scripture, I want to read this one more time. In Ephesians 6, verse 18, it says, Pray at all times in the Spirit and with every prayer and request. And stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for the saints. Charles, come join me up here real quick. And I need, I feel like this is like a youth event. I need my man right here. Yeah, right here. What's your name? Dominic. Dominic? Come on, come on. I need you, Dominic. Charles, stand on this side over here. Pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Dominic, face that way. Just face that way. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm not going to like bend over and have somebody push you. Nothing like that. Pray at all times in the spirit. Stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Dominic. Why'd you let me push you over, bro? Why'd you let me push you over? <laughs> All right, you can face me. You can face me. You can face me. Okay, don't let me push you at all. Don't let, don't let your feet move. You can put your hands in front of you if you need, you know. I love the confidence. Don't let me push you. Oh, yeah, he wired your stance out. Why you do it like that? <laughs> well, widening out the stance. Don't let me push you. All right, ready? Ready? He said, I don't need no hands. <laughs> Come on, stay alert. Stay alert. Stay alert. When we're praying in the spirit at all times for every prayer and every request, and we're staying alert, there is nothing that can move us. We can't be moved. We have on the full armor of God. Amen. Now face that way one more time. It's okay. I'm not going to push you. Yeah, keep facing that way. Okay, now Charles, come try to come try to get to Dominic. Just try to get through. I mean, relax, bro. Not to come on. Try to get through. Come on, <laughs> come on, come on. The word says in all intercession for all the saints. So even if Dominic is not facing me and he's alert on his blind side, I'm interceding for him. Anything that the enemy's trying to do as he's wrestling with flesh and blood, I'm interceding for him. He's not getting to him. I'm interceding for all the saints. For all the saints. You can have a seat, Dominic. You can sit down. Appreciate it. For all the saints. I'm interceding and I'm staying alert. And so one thing that I did when I fasted for 40 days... I caught about three or four people, and I said, guys, I'm going on a fast. It's something I've never done at this length, but this is what the Lord said, so I'm doing it. I need you guys to be praying for me during this thing. They said, of course, Chi, how long are you fasting? I said, 40 days. All right. Every week I'm going to check in with you, and I'm going to say, Chi, I'm praying for you right now. I'm praying for you right now. 
that as you wrestle, not with flesh and blood, but every principality and darkness and evil thing that's found in the heavenly place, as you're staying alert on one side, I'm going to be interceding for you and I'm going to get the sides that you can't see. Because come hell or high water, you're going to hear from the Lord. You're going to hear from the Lord. Now I want to do something. I want to do something that's going to take and require a different level of transparency and courage and boldness and vulnerability from all of us. Because I believe that there are people in this room that have been believing for something. And the enemy has been wrestling with you and has been coming for you and has been coming for your marriage and has been coming for your children and you're believing for them to be back. You're believing for the joy and the passion of your marriage to be restored. He's been coming for your mental health. He's been coming for your physical body. He's been coming for your business and your finances. He's been coming for the spirit that God has placed inside of you. He's been coming. And you're at a position where you're like, I don't know if I should pray more. For one, I feel like the Lord is going to ask somebody to fast today, even if it's just one. But you're in a position now, and you're like, I need someone to intercede for me. I need someone to intercede for me. Maybe you've never, in your walk with the Lord, asked somebody specifically to intercede for you by name. I know Pastor Shim is, a, is above the intercessory team, and they do their thing on Saturdays, and it's amazing, and they're interceding, which is incredible. A lot of churches don't even do that. But then there's another level when somebody can intercede for you by name and say, hey, you're not fighting this thing alone. I know it. I know it. There are people in this room that are like, I need that intercession. I'm in the middle of that. I need that intercession. I need that intercession. So what I'm going to do here in a moment, I'm going to ask. I said here in a moment, this is the moment. If you're in this room and you're saying, I need someone to intercede for me. I need that covering. I want somebody to call me by my name and stand in the gap for me. For whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. I'm just going to ask you to stand to your feet for a second. Come on, there's freedom in this house. Stand up right now, right now, stand up. If you need that intercession. If you need that intercession, come on, stand up, stand up. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Now, this is only half the battle. Praise God for y'all for the first, first of all. Now, what I want to do next is if you're sitting down, if you're sitting down, y'all thought y'all were getting away or something? If you're sitting down, I want you to look around at the people standing up. Just look at them. Just look at them. If you know any of them, if you know their name, maybe you don't know their name. Maybe the Holy Spirit is just highlighting a person to you. We're going to make a commitment this week. If somebody is standing around you and you're sitting down, can you make a commitment to intercede for that person this week? Come on, look at them, lock them in, because after this service concludes, I'm going to need you to go to that person. If you know them and have their number, perfect. That makes it easy. Go up to them and say, this week, I'm interceding for you by name. By name. And then go beyond that. The moment that you pray for them, send them a message and say, I just prayed and interceded for you. Watch what God does in just a week's time. Watch the testimonies that'll happen in just a week's time. When we take Ephesians 6, 18 seriously and say we're gonna pray in the spirit and we're gonna uh, intercede for all of the saints. For all of the saints. I love this, God gets to somebody every time. What's your name right here? Say it again. Leslie, Leslie. Come on, I need somebody right now. I need a lady in here right now that'll commit to interceding for Leslie. Come on, somebody, it doesn't matter. Right here, right here, come here, come here, come here. 
We said this in the first service. Just lay, just put a hand on Leslie's back right here. We said this in the first service. Leslie, this house can't do all it's been created and called to do if you're not doing all you've been called to do. God has a plan for you. And the enemy would want nothing more than to stop what God is doing in your life. In your life. What's your name, ma'am? I'm sorry. Yvonne. Yvonne, we get the fun job. This week, do you know Yvonne? Oh, I love it. Even better. So y'all are going to exchange information. And this week, Yvonne, intercede for her. And the moment you do, send her a message and say, Leslie, I'm standing in the gap for you right now. I'm standing in the gap for you right now because, Leslie, you're not fighting alone. You're never meant to fight alone. Any battle in your mind, heart, physical, or spiritual, you're not fighting alone. And I believe people even beyond Yvonne, I'm sure there was a handful of people that said, you know what, I can pray for her. I'm just too far away. They're going to intercede for you too. Amen. Amen. Look around. Come on, just a couple more minutes. Lock them in. Lock them in. This is my fun part too. Come on, Holy Spirit. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. My man right here in the white collared shirt. What's your name? Say it again. Brunel. Ranel. I love that. I love that. Ranel, I'm committed to interceding for you. I got somebody in service A. And I said, God, I want somebody in second service too. Because I take this very seriously. If the word said it, that's all I need. That's all I need. So, Rennell, come find me afterwards. I'm going to get your number. And when I pray for you and the guy that I committed to in service A at the 9 a.m., I'm going to send you a message. I'm going to say, Rennell, I'm believing for you. I'm pulling for you. I'm standing in the gap for you. In Jesus' name. Come on, 10 more seconds. I love it. Exchanging information right here. It said, do it now, Jesus. Do it now. I don't want the, the, hey, I'll keep you in my prayers. You'll be in my thoughts. Y'all yeah, be praying for you this week. Call me by my name, please, because God does. Amen. Come on, if you're standing here, just raise a hand in the heavens. Let's pray for you. Father, we thank you so much. God, we are going to intercede for this body. We are going to intercede for this body. Holy Spirit, highlight those that you want us to stand in the gap for. God, we thank you that every person that stood up in boldness and in courage, that you would meet them in that place. Father, if you're calling anybody in this room to fast for what they've been believing for, we thank you that you would give them the strength to walk into that, that you would surround them with people that would intercede, that would stand in the gap for them. Father, we thank you in advance for the testimony that'll come from a house of intercession. Father, your son quoted your word and he said that this should be a house of prayer, not a house of, of worship or a house of sermons. All those things are great and are important, but you said that this should be a house of prayer. Let prayer be the building blocks for what you're doing in this season. God, as you build your church, let us adopt the life of intercession and we'll rejoice in advance before we ever even see anything change. We'll rejoice as if it's already done. In Jesus' name, and everybody shouted amen. Come on.